please welcome to the stage our next panel, The Future of Advertising, Media, and Marketing to Societal and Workplace Equality, with Kathleen Griffith, Founder, CEO at Grace & Co., Laura Zelenko, Senior Executive Editor for Diversity, Talent, Standards, and Training, Bloomberg News, Bloomberg, Sarah Watson, Global Chief Strategy Officer and Chairman, BBH New York, and moderated by Judith Harrison, Senior Vice President, Diversity and Inclusion, Weber Shandwick. Hey everyone. Thank you. Almost the weekend, we're almost there. <laughs> yes, exactly, happy Friday to all. But more importantly than that, I'm um, so glad to be here with all of you today. I wanted to just talk a bit about um, the effect of advertising and branding and media on the workplace, on the way we think about ourselves outside of the workplace as well. But before I do that, what I want to do is have our panelists just tell you a little bit more about themselves, do quick introductions, and when they're done, I'll do a quicker introduction of myself, and we will dive right in. So why don't we start with you, Sarah? Hi there. So I am Sarah Watson. I am, these days, the chairman of BBH New York. I'm a strategist by background. So BBH is a creative advertising agency. We have big clients like, um, you know, PlayStation, Vaseline, we do um, lots of kind of big broadcast stuff that you might have seen. Um, I'm a very long-standing member of uh, BBH, and I describe myself as the conscience of it these days, uh, of this office anyway. Hi, I'm Laura Zelenko. I have been at Bloomberg for 25 years, so when I started, the news division was basically a startup, um, and we've uh, grown to uh, more than uh, 2,700 journalists and analysts in over a 120 countries. Um, I am responsible now for improving our representation um, both within our workforce and in our content, and I hope we can talk about those initiatives today. I'm Kathleen Griffith. I am the founder and CEO of Grace & Co. We are a marketing strategy agency that works with brands on helping them reach and engage the female consumer. So we only work on women all day, every day, which is a lot of fun. Um, I started it about four years ago, so um, still getting my feet wet in the entrepreneurial sphere, um, but we get to work with clients like Vice and Nike Women and Verizon uh, and have a lot of fun doing it, so glad to be here. Thank you. I'm Judith Harrison. I lead diversity and inclusion at Weber Shandwick, which is one of the world's largest global PR organizations. Um, diversity and inclusion is basically what I do all day, every day, not just at Weber Shandwick, but outside as well. I feel that my mission in life is really to empower women and underrepresented people, not only in the marketing communication space, but outside and in life as well. So to that end, I'm also president of the PRSA Foundation, which exists to promote diversity and inclusion in the public relations space. And we just published a book called Profiles in uh, Diverse Voices, Profiles in Leadership, which is all about what it's like to be a multicultural person or minority of some sort in the PR industry. So it's, it's a really um, interesting project, and I'm thrilled about it. And I am also, in my extra spare time, president of New York <laughs> Women in Communications, um, which is a phenomenal organization for advancing women in every aspect of communications. So, deep breath. Um, ready to dive into our discussion. So I wanted to talk a bit about how what we do, all of us do, affects the workplace. And as we all know, workplace culture doesn't exist in a vacuum. Culture is created and driven by human beings, all of whom are subject to being influenced by media in all of its forms. So how does the way we portray ourselves, the way we, the stories we tell ourselves about who we are and our place in the world, how does that impact our workplace cultures? How does it impact the way we think and the way we behave, not just within the workplace, but outside as well? Um, hashtag See Her, which is an initiative founded by the Association of National Advertisers, 
um, to create more accurate portrayals of women in advertising and program, actually boost them by 20% by the year 2020. Uh, they've done some studies and have, they've come up with some really interesting and impactful information about that. And to me, one of the most poignant things that they have come up with is that the underrepresentation of women in STEM is directly tied to the way women are portrayed in advertising and all forms of media. So I think that that is very interesting and quite sad as well. Um, I think that accurate portrayal of women is critical. We need to be portrayed as human, fully human, fully diverse, and strong. Uh, I think that if that happens, when that happens, I should never say if, when that happens, women and girls will be much more inspired to reach their full potential. When they see real reflections of themselves in all of the media and programming that is available. So as the saying goes, if you see her, you can be her. So with that, I want to dive into our discussion here. And first, I want to talk a little bit about advertising and sort of the numbers involved. Um, research presented at the Cannes Lions in 2017 noted that there are twice as many male characters as female characters in ads. Twice as many. And that there are, I think, 25% of ads feature men while only 5% feature women. And in ads, men are 62% more likely to be portrayed as intelligent than women. So when you think about that, and the fact that 50% of the population are women, and women drive 70 to 80% of consumer purchases, you have to ask yourself, what is wrong with this picture? How did this happen? Um, and so I wanted to just throw the ball to Kathleen, um, given her specialty in advertising and marketing to women. Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling as you're talking, <laughs> but I'm raging inside. Um, and it's, it's really why I started my company. I was so rageful <laughs> on a daily basis about what I was seeing and what we were producing um, that I decided to go and, and do something about it and um, have the good fortune of working here too with Sarah and, and with Cam Lions and trying to help uh, change the game a bit. So you talked a bit about time. Um, I think to really level set there, because a lot gets thrown out, but if you look at the World Economic Forum, we will not reach gender parity for 200 more years. So, like, raise your hand if that doesn't really work for you, <laughs> right? Um, and I really yeah. believe, and I think all of us here believe, that advertising and media is the fastest accelerant to drive cultural change and to enable us to see things for ourselves that we otherwise have not seen. And I think, you know, it's been a history of backward slides and forward momentum. You know, we've had uber commodification and sexualization to asexualization to marginalizing us with kind of insecurity to then you know hyper empowerment and the pendulum kind of swings here and there um, but i think ultimately when we really look at it what is so powerful is that if we take it really seriously and i think part of the problem is we have not taken advertising and media seriously enough as a culture in terms of the messages that it is sending not only ourselves in terms of what we can be, but our young girls in terms of what they can dream. And um, I had just seen something recently that moms Google is my son a genius twice as much as they Google is my daughter a genius. So oh that just shows kind of how endemic um, the issue is here. We have less than 13% women, female business owners. I certainly am one of them. I never thought I could have my own business. That was just like totally out of the question because it was not something that I, I saw, right? Um, it's something we so rarely see for ourselves. So I think one is just taking it really seriously, mm -hmm. um, but what we're seeing, which is really exciting, is things are moving forward in an unprecedented way. So you talked about rallying around hashtags. We have seen in the past three years a 300% uptick in women talking about women-related issues and rallying around these, these great campaigns and ads, you know, Nikes until we all win, that came out, that provoked conversation because it was all of us, 
you know, about us pulling together. Um, so I think we have that. We're seeing more and more of that, which is good. Um, but we also really need to make sure that the representation is not only us being present, so we need to be present, we're not present, uh, you know, often, um, but it's how we're pro portrayed. And exactly. you talked about multifaceted, multi-ability, seeing ourselves in all of the various roles that we can be, because so often that character or characterization is so one-dimensional. And that's something that a lot of us are in the throes of trying to change and do. And one of the quickest ways we can do that is to have women be big surprise, part of the entire supply chain and process, all the way from strategy down to creative, um, on and on to what gets placed in media and marketing. I mean, so, I think what you're saying, you know, I think looking at this as a continuum is, is, is what's so important. And we've, we've spent a lot of time looking at the workforce. And in a newsroom, you're looking at who's telling the story, who's editing and shaping the story, who's deciding where that story runs. But it also matters who are you who are you going to to get the perspective and the approach, and what kinds of stories are you going to tell? So who's informing the stories that you're yeah. telling, what, what stories you tell and how you tell them? And what we've done, the, 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 the common number of uh, the statistic for women on front pages, as sources on front pages globally is about 20%. Um, and I think that uh, journalists often don't really think about how the actual numbers of who, who they are quoting. So we did some research, and we found on our, what we call our front pages, our top pages, we were quoting women in 2% of the stories. And it was, it was really a revelation to all of us. We made a big point of pointing it out, of developing ways to track it. And, um, we've, and team by team, country by country, region by region, that number is now above 6%. It's growing every single week. We, we make the numbers very uh, public. And um, you actually are seeing some pride within the office that they're doing something that's changing. And I hopefully it's leading it. to better coverage. That's obviously the idea. I'm sure it is. It has to be. I think that it is, it's so important to do that tracking and measuring because as the saying goes, what gets measured gets done. And what doesn't get measured does not get done. So you're absolutely doing the right thing there. And then from an inclusion perspective, making sure that you've got diverse representation in terms of not just women, but also race and sexual orientation and all of the things that go into making us who we are. So the decisions about what stories to tell and who's telling the stories right. and what the perspectives are, I think those are absolutely critical and I'm so glad that we're really starting to pay much more attention to them now than we did in the past. That's huge. I'd love to pick on this th yeah. theme of the supply chain <laughs> uh, because I, I've no, actually never thought about it before. So my role as a strategist in in advertising is, you know, I take the client brief, um, you know, I look at all and the... And she's, she's like one of the most brilliant minds in our whole industry, so just to... I'm sorry, I just, I just <laughs> Very that. sweet of you, lovely. Um, but, but to explain the job, we, we, we look at the client brief, uh, we look at all the data in the market, we talk to the consumers, we kind of figure out what's going on. And it's really interesting, I've only just thought about this, listening to you guys talk, is that there are a lot of female strategists there are a lot of female strategists. So you, you will actually get a female point of view at the fat end of the sausage machine, if you like. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then, of course, we go into the creative department, this is a traditional process, which is white men, vastly majority. And then that will go into photographers and directors, mm -hmm. who are also white men. Mm -hmm. And so, it, so it's very interesting, actually, on how many levels mm -hmm. this kind of unconscious bias works, mm -hmm. because there have been lots of amazing initiatives by the likes of Unilever and Johnson Johnson in the, in the last five years, I think, really, d saying things like, okay, if, you know, if there is a man and a woman in an ad, and the woman's in the kitchen, and the man's coming home from work, flip them, just flip them. I mean, there's basic right. things that we can do like that. Um, and that's cool, uh, that's a start, but you still get into the male gaze. Mm. And yes. the idea that all these, everything about the way these experiences are portrayed is ultimately created by the eyes of men, um, just has such a profound effect on every single thing we do. Mm. That is so true. And it, it actually brings me to something interesting that I just read. And it is about how vice 
partnered with Gloria Steinem and USC Annenberg on this new project. It's a documentary series called Women or Woman, and Gloria Steinem did it, but now they're teaching students how to make their own sort of socially conscious documentaries. And so you're really changing who's behind the camera and whose gaze um, we are looking at and operating under. And I'm wondering if you think this is the kind of thing that will have broad impact or if it's going to be something where sort of a small committed cadre of students are basically preaching to the choir. I think at the moment we've got a, a kind of elite group of clients, organizations, who are really willing to change and to do things and to try things. And it, I think you guys were hearing from um, Volkswagen about their pay equality initiative. And, and there are people like that who are doing these moonshot initiatives where they really want to be seen to be doing something different. The, the data that you quote is very interesting mm -hmm. because it's, it's amazing the analysis that, uh, in particular, the Gina Davis Institute, which yes. is a brilliant kind of organization in, in this instance, it could minutely um, observe the entire body of kind of marketing materials to see, yes, to what extent women talk, to what extent women are shown to have jobs, to what yes. extent women are funny, to what extent women use words of more than one syllable, like all that sort yeah. of thing. And you see that there, it, as much as there is this kind of moonshot layer of awesome kind of cool things, like some of which we've mentioned already, then there is this entire body underneath it, particularly in, in our industry, um, where it's not really changing. But, but it's, you know, I was yeah. just going to say it's very interesting. Annenberg, um, USC Annenberg, has done some fabulous research on representation in film. Mm -hmm. And if you go through the continuum, back to the continuum of getting the script writer and who's, who, are the, who are the actors, who's right. the director, and you sort of go through and then what are they saying and, and what parts of the movie are they actually quoted in, you can apply that absolutely directly to the media. And then, right. and then you have to start look, sort of going under the cover and saying, now why are we choosing those people? What do we need yes. to do specifically to make sure that process changes? And that's one thing that we've been looking at very specifically, which is why is it that we, for instance, quote men so often, like, or bring them on TV so often? At the start of the year, we had 10% of our outside guests on TV were men. I mean, were women. 10%. That's amazing. And when you start looking at what the reasons are, part of it is potentially the journalist bias or just that it's mm -hmm. easier to get the people that they know or they go back to the same people. Right. Part of it is who's actually putting, what are, what are the companies actually putting in front of them when you call the PR agency? I mean, there's a lot of people involved here. <laughs> who are they push, you know, who are they fronting? Or, you know, women have some of the responsibility too. You do find the woman that you want to bring on, a, a top expert, and like, ah, don't really feel like I'm comfortable enough. And so one thing that we're doing is that we are saying, um, we started funding a, a media training uh, program for women executives mm -hmm. and um, four hour media training in four different cities in the world, in Hong Kong, London, Toronto, and New York. And the change of just the, the, the number of people that we're bringing in now, they're all fabulous experts on their, on their, in their areas in finance and business. We've already seen the number go up to 15% of our outside guests. And our goal is to get, you know, all the way to parity. I can. love it. And I, I think you hit on something so important. You know, we're talking basically about how the sausage gets made. <laughs> um, and I think that women and everybody needs to raise their hand for these opportunities mm -hmm. to be spokespeople, to be experts. I think that there may be, you know, some element of people, women sort of as you say, shying away from that limelight, shying away from saying, I am an expert in whatever the subject is, particularly if it is a traditionally male-oriented subject, as people think finance is. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is certainly something that we need to consciously change. And, and I think being intentional um, mm -hmm. is probably my favorite word, because that's the only way, in my mind, anything changes. It's not an accident that's going to happen. You really have to, as you are, mm -hmm. and we are at Weber Shadwick, being intentional about making that change happen. And I believe that part of that change or part of that intentionality can come from client pressure. 
as well. So, you know, we certainly see companies that are, they want to be on the cutting edge of making that sort of change so that women are out front and diversity of all kinds are out front. I wanted to find out from you, Sarah and Kathleen, what you are hearing and seeing of that and what effect it's having on the supply chain, so to speak. Well, like Sarah said, I mean, there's a, a group of brands that are very, the kind of elite forward leaning brands that are, are very committed to this. And I think anything that they put out in the market, they live and breathe internally as well. Um, what I think is really encouraging and actually exciting is in a desire to get more and more female consumers, we have um, close to 83% of women as a result of the stats you mentioned before, now saying they no longer trust brands. So big brands, which is relatively unprecedented. You know, we used to be kind of loyal, you know, beyond reason a bit, and we would hang out even though if, you know, something felt it didn't represent us ac accurately. And now with the rise of these indie and upstart and smaller brands, the, these independent brands, women are just going there. You know, they're feeling seen and heard and represented. And so that's where, where they're going. So I think there's tremendous power also from a consumer perspective, you know, for those of you who aren't necessarily in marketing to really think about how you can continue to get behind those, those brands that really matter to you, um, that you feel like represent you, and then turn away from those that don't because what we're seeing is then brands are often not only changing their marketing, which is what they ironically tend to do first, they'll put this you know, great campaign out in market about you know, how incredible their product is and maybe it does all the right things from a supply chain perspective, that then forces them to change internally their internal cultures after because no longer is it acceptable to not eat, sleep, breathe the exact same values internally as what you're marketing and feeding to consumers externally. So that's exciting. We've got a kind of unprecedented power in this space too as consu female consumers. Absolutely, I think that's a hugely important point too and it, it brings me to the whole idea of corporate social responsibility and what impact that may have on consumers and you know whether we vote with our pocketbooks. So there are brands that are doing a great job in aligning their values with you know who they are, what they do, how they market. Um, Puma just came out with a new platform I think a couple of weeks ago um, called Hashtag Reform that enables celebrities and um, athletes to really talk about their need for social justice and all the things they're doing. Does that sort of thing, do you think, provoke more loyalty, more brand loyalty, or does it not make a difference? It, we probably have a similar and, Well, the, the, question, the answer is it depends. Mm -hmm. It really depends. And I think we're in a world now where um, I think all clients want to jump on the woke bandwagon. Yes, exactly. And I do feel that every pitch that I've done in the last 18 months, two years probably, if not three years, has said we, we don't want to be a brand, we want to start a movement. We don't want to pay for our advertising, we want to be part of people's identity. I mean, this is the common language of, of all brands but, now. But where are they drawing that inspiration? From? Like, to what degree are they reaching into the communities and reaching into the cultures to actually make sure that they're not getting it wrong. Great question. Exactly. I mean, the, the, some do and some don't, and we see them crash and burn. And I think we're now in a world where you guys kind of, you know, the, the emerging audience is so sophisticated and so quick and so sure of their voices to call this stuff out if it's not absolutely being lived within the organization that the penalties for getting it wrong are so vast. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we really are just living in a new, entirely new era of transparency where brands, you know, they are right to ask, by the way, for a movement because we, can't, we just can't buy attention anymore. We have to speak to something in deep, deeper in people, but we also carry a much greater responsibility than ever to make sure it's true. So, so the answer is, it, yes, it works phenomenally when you get it right and when it's true and when you don't, yes. you will crash and burn. Exactly. And that is the beauty of social media. I mean, there are so many great things about it, but one of the things that I see is that it has taken the conversation between brands and people from just sort of this one way we are speaking at you sort of dialogue or monologue to a real conversation where you as consumers have the power to talk right back to the brands and say, 
we don't agree with what you're doing, you're being hypocritical, and therefore we are going to just turn away and go elsewhere. So it just gives you so much more power than you ever had before, and that's a power that needs to be exercised. No question in my mind about that. I'm also thinking about um, advertising and our workplace cultures and sort of how they affect the work that we actually do. And so there are advertisers like P&G that have done a phenomenal job on advertising to women, on representing um, people of color in really smart, creative ways. Um, I know that P&G has something called The Talk, it's a video that shows how um, black parents have spoken with their children about race over the course of maybe 30 or 40 years and it is heartbreaking and beautiful and so incredibly relevant. Um, and there are others like the Ad Council that has done Love Has No Labels, mm -hmm. which is one of my favorite campaigns and really shows that you know, who you love is who you love and there's no judgment about it, period. Um, so they, they've done a spectacular job. But then on the other hand, there are brands that have not quite gotten the message yet. Uh, and I have to wonder about how much their internal culture um, really affects that. So uh, specifically, what I had in my mind was the H&M ad that had a little black boy with a hoodie that said, coolest monkey in the jungle. And you have to wonder who is in the room when that is being approved. When, I mean, when someone says that's a good idea, who's piping up and saying, yep, that's the way to go? And you know what's interesting about that is that in the past, when we were teenagers, or at least I can talk about myself, you know, I, would, I may not have been as aware of all of this uh, kind of advertising, but now with social media, I have two teenagers they react to something like that, like like that, and right. it goes, and, and, it, and it gets, as you said, the reaction can be very strong, and I think part of it is just the accessibility and the fact that where, gener where the younger generation is going, this, this is not acceptable, and the reaction is, is, doesn't take long for the, I guess, for the advertisers to figure that out. I'd say that it's probably to do with, there's, there's lots of, obviously, workplace and culture issues, and who is in the workplace, yes. um, which, is, which is massive. I think in the is issue of the Kendall Jenner, oh. I, uh, the Pepsi ad, I think, you know, we deal with a lot of clients like Pepsi, and I, am, I, am, I can guarantee you that ad would have gone through half a million dollars worth of link, mm -hmm. quantitative link tests. They would have put it in front of consumers, um, and they would have asked questions like, this ad was aspirational. Well, that would check that box. I couldn't fail to believe that this ad was for Pepsi. Kate failed to see that this ad was for Pepsi. Yeah, it's very well branded. Um, the product looked appetizing. Yeah, I, it would have sailed through all those measures that they research it on. But of course, there is a new measure now, which is, you know, is this contributing to the social conversation in a, yeah. in a constructive way? Right. And that's what people aren't measuring for. And it's hard to, you know, you have to have a whole other level of strategic nous about you, really. Absolutely. And I think part of it goes to who is in the focus groups or yeah, who, yeah. who's being yeah. asked yeah. about whether this is relevant and whether it makes any sense. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that ad was one of my favorite examples. I remember after it came out, um, Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, daughter, Bernice, said, if only my father had known about Pepsi, you know? Yeah. Like, life would have been so much easier. <laughs> so, you know, it just sort of goes to who's in the workplace and, and what's going on with them. So what I want to know at this point is sort of advice for everyone here. What can we do individually and also sort of collectively to influence advertisers and marketers and corporate responsibility um, leaders to do the right thing? You want to go first? Yeah, I can take it. I mean, I think if you're in a marketing department, the first thing is mandates of your agencies to require that women actually be part of the process end to end. That is a very fast way to accelerate this change. I think on the consumer side of things, really getting angry. So, you know, for those of us who are in a position to 
on a frequent basis be able to comment and respond and then boycott brands that you do not feel like are serving you, I think is um, makes a lot of sense. And then again, continuing to think about what you're consuming uh, as a female consumer. So the younger generation is really good at that. Um, but for those of us who are a little bit older, it's actually one of those things you have to <laughs> actively remind yourself to do. Um, so I'd say that. And I'm a, I really believe strongly in this continuum and, 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 and attack, it's sort of looking at these issues at every level in the workplace exactly. and in terms of who's feeding you the, the ideas and, and, and what are you, where are you making the decisions on what you're actually putting back out there. And so the first thing you really need to focus on is the data. You have to collect the data for every level in the workplace. You have to review the data with your managers. You, you have to find ways to track, as I said, the data on who you're quoting, you know, exactly. and, and, and that, Getting the data is one thing, and then tracking it and reviewing it is the second thing that's super important. And we did that when, when we were looking at how many stories actually quote women. We developed a new publishing tool technologically so that we, we can now do that, and that will right. be there forever. So that I leave, it, someone, you know, it, it will stay there, and hopefully the, the organization will then continue to track this to the point where it doesn't need to be tracked anymore, hopefully. And the final thing is that even with the data, you really need to focus on cultural change, I think, in the Absolutely. organization. And one thing can't be done without the other. And, and that means taking a stand on these issues. So, you know, I really believe we should, know, we should insist on no more all-male meetings. You know, if, if, you're, if you're walking by a room and you see 10 men discussing what the story should be, you know, That's there should be a knock on the door and say, let's bring in some different representation here and, and have a discussion. So that's one thing. We, look, we talk a lot about how we do events and, and what, what the diversity makeup is on the panels and, and that sort of thing. So every, every chance that you have to if, affect the culture in conjunction with looking at the data is, is I think, very important. I think the, you hit on the inclusion piece, which is so critical. Um, because what you want to do as people who are out in the workforce, you want to go back to your companies and look around, and if you're not seeing gender representation the way you should be, if you're not seeing cultural rep uh, representation the way you should be, you need to talk with your leaders about that, mm -hmm. not just about the numbers, but about what they're doing and what you all can do to create an environment that is inclusive in which everybody can thrive. An environment in which people understand that this is not just a kumbaya moment, that it really affects the bottom line. You've got to have inclusion in order to make your numbers go up. Mm -hmm. And you need to raise your hand. If there's an opportunity to create um, a diversity and inclusion workforce or, or a task force, get on it, lead it. Don't hesitate to raise your hand and be the change that you want to see at your company. And then that sort of translates out into the world. Um, I think that there are a few things more important than that. If we're going to really change the equation and change the conversation, we have to do more than talk. We have to go back to our companies and back to our spheres of influence and do everything we can to make that change happen. Sarah? So the way I think of it like this is imagine if we lived in a world where all the films, all the TV, all the newspapers, all the advertising communications had all been made by women. And then, oh, bit by bit, the men started to say, oh, 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 hey, can't we be part of this? And started to make communications. And imagine the new forms of creativity that would arise and the new kind of markets and brands that would show up and it would be such an exciting time of kind of... And it's only when you put it on its head like that that you kind of think, well, that is the world that we're in at the moment. We are just in this... We have this extraordinary opportunity where the vo our voices, the voices of, of, of women, have not been at the forefront of this. And so we are at a time of revolution. And so, and so much is going to have to change. So much in every nook and cranny. And you're, every single one of you can be part of this in your own way, greater or small. You may be clients, you may have lots of agencies, you might be a creator yourself. We, we just, it's just so, so exciting. And to quote the, uh, 
amazing Cindy Gallup, there is a shit ton of money to be made by giving women what they want. <laughs> and when well you said. do see... That's true. Totally. It was, as Kathleen says, when you see these little brands pop up, that just all of a sudden speak this new language. It just feels so fresh and it just feels so relevant. And there is so much opportunity in just finding those new voices there. So mm -hmm. I think look for the opportunities to, to just, you know, the door is open now. We have to run through it and seize this opportunity. And it's not just about reflecting culture, which is really, I think, the marketing mm -hmm. culture that I grew up in, which is we do the focus group, we give people what they want. Mm -hmm. Now we're in a world where we, we've got to lead it. You know, mm -hmm. we, we can step forward and we can create a vision, sh sh you know, create a vision of the world where more people People see themselves represented to exactly to where Kathleen started. You know, it's so interesting. It, it just reminds me of two ex experiments that I've seen taking place. One is um, a group called, I think it's called News Mavens out of Poland, and they actually draw on women editors from around the world to create their own front page every day. What stories wow. are they choosing versus what you're actually seeing? Right. And it's just fascinating. I and mean, when you sort of think about it as, a, as, a, as an experiment, and, and the other thing was, as an experiment, and the other thing was, um, there was a video created in Hong Kong that I saw. It was at, uh, at a conference where they had three women uh, CEOs act as uh, they were in interviewing a man for a board seat. And they were asking the questions, but they were asking questions that are typically asked of women. And when you see it coming from a woman and knowing that the other person on the other end of the camera is, is a man, it's something like, well, you do realize that we're a... Uh, um, a, a manufacturing company, so it may, so the job may require walking, in, you know, in some you know certain areas. Do you think you have the right yeah. shoes? Yeah, exactly. you know? uh -huh. wow. And you do realize that there is travel involved yeah. in this job. Yeah. So who's going to take care of your children while you're gone? Yeah, I mean, there are you know some ridiculous stereotypes that. Um, they don't entirely refuse to go away, but they're a little too slow for my taste. So, you know, it is up to all of us to make sure that they depart this world as quickly as possible. Um, that every stereotype about women, about any underrepresented group, goes the way of the dinosaur. And we can all do it. We can actually make the effort and make it happen. I have no doubt in my mind about that at all. So I think that that is a good note on which to close this. And uh, I thank you all so much for being here. And I thank my panel. Thank you. Thank you.